So I'm taking a pause on the secret of contentment, although everything that I'm going to preach really is going to hit contentment if we can actually hit it. But my dad and I were talking on the phone this week, and uh, he said, I don't know if I've told you this, this story before, but it's a good one. And, and he started to tell me about Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles 20. And uh, I, I thought, Dad, I've preached on that, I don't know how many times you've heard me preach on it. But he was so determined that I was supposed to hear this. And I do believe, as he spoke to me, there were a couple lines in that story that just stuck out. And I thought, this is, a, this is God's word for today. And so thanks, Dad, for watching online. Um, you have inspired this message. And yes, I, I have preached this before, but every time I preach a message, I see something new. So there's, there's new stuff in it, but some of the old stuff, my dad said one time, I said, Dad, sometimes I feel repetitive, but that's what preaching is. That's actually what it means. To preach means to repeat. And uh, I said, sometimes I feel a little repetitive. He said, well, Chris, when they start living it, you can stop telling them about it. So guess what? Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18. This is one of my favorite scriptures. I quote the 18th verse very much, but I want to have the lead in. So this is going to be kind of our foundational text. Then we're going to see this done really well in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 with Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Lord, anoint your word. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. And what a timely word. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, because whatever is seen is temporary. Whatever is unseen is eternal. Now, turn in your Bibles. I love that, that the Apostle Paul said, turn in your Bibles to, to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I love that the Apostle Paul said, our light and momentary troubles. Can you categorize what you're going through right now as light and momentary? It is. It is. It's temporary. Whatever is seen is temporary. And, and it's, it's light only because he compares it to the glory that will be revealed in you. And that is explosive. I don't even know how to put that in words other than what he said. That glory that will be revealed not around you, not, not beside you, within you. That makes whatever you're going through light compared to that. Don't you know that the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you? The very same, that's, your, that's what your Bible says, the very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. The glory that is being revealed in us. Light and momentary troubles. Second Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to take this in steps. Because this guy, he did it right here. Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. I'm just gonna, I just realized I had an effect on, on my mic. This will clean it up a little bit. Clean up my voice. There we go. Because the trials have come so that you can perfect how to go through a trial. They're, they're the weights. And when you can do the, the certain weight, what do you do? You grab the bigger weight and you go for it, and then you grab the bigger weight, and you keep on going. And every trial, have you noticed that your trials keep getting harder and harder and harder? That's because you're in God's gym. <laughs> and it's by design. And it's so that you will learn how to walk with Him. Uh, 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 we're going we're gonna to end with a scripture. Actually, let's bookend it with another scripture. Though this is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer griefs in all kinds of trials, these have come 
So, and I like that because that's purpose. That it's not just, oh, I'm, I'm a victim. These have come, that's a statement of purpose, that the proven genuineness, genuineness of your faith, your faith, just faith in, in your ability? No, faith in, in well, time will, will, it'll pass. No, faith in God. So that your faith of, of in God, which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed in your situation. These have come. Can you look at your trial and say, this has come on purpose? Oh man, this has come on purpose because it's working something out deep inside of me. Let's look at a success story. Second Chronicles chapter 20. And look at the first four verses at first. We're gonna look at the whole chapter eventually. So get, so get a coloring page if you need it. Verse one. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Munites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. That's three armies, did you count them? Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already in Hazazon Tamar, that is, En Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Alarmed. Did something come to you and you were alarmed? Was your response to immediately seek the Lord? I wish it was for me. I'm learning. I'm learning. I am learning. But that is not a natural response. Your natural response is survival instinct. It's it's fight or flight. It's to argue. It's to prepare. It's to plan. But here's the odd part about Jehoshaphat's response. He has three armies coming at him. The last thing you want to do is starve your army. He called a fast. He called a fast. Everybody throughout the... the uh, yeah, we got to get ready for war. No, we got to inquire of the Lord. Why? That's like that is so, so counterproductive in the natural. I'm going to call the fast and starve my army. They're going to be weak, but they'll be strong. See, it's all supernatural thinking. I'm going to call a fast. It, here's the backstory to Jehoshaphat. I. When I was preparing this, this is one of the, the additions to this to this uh, teaching, is I went back to look at, did Jehoshaphat always do it right? And you know what? He did a pretty good job. At the end of his life, he kind of messed up a little bit. There's, there's no perfect person in the Bible. Do you find that relieving? <laughs> do you find that comforting? There's not one per The Bible is full of imperfect, God dealing with imperfect people. Jehoshaphat's dad, King Asa, he was terrible. And one of the things that he did, he used logic before he used faith. Well, this is going to challenge some people. So he had armies coming at him. And what he did is he went to a neighboring country and he took and he paid them off to help protect Judah. This is South Israel. He, he took money out of his own household, oh, very nice, but also out of the temple, out of God's temple. He emptied it so he could pay off another country to protect him. Bad idea. He emptied the temple of God who could protect them and instead took that from the very great immortal being that could protect them, all-powerful being that could protect them, and he put all those resources into another country. Where are you moving your resources? What, what dialogue? 
Are you quick to go and have a conversation with someone? Or are you quick to go to prayer with someone? With, with someone? Or just go to prayer with God? Where are you putting your resources right now? There was another thing that King Asa, Jehoshaphat's dad, did. He had an infection. And it said he, he only inquired physicians. It's just a couple chapters before. You can read it yourself. He only, in, in, he didn't, it says he specifically didn't inquire of God, didn't even ask for a healing. Instead, he only inquired the doctors. What's your response to your ailment? And it actually says God was offended by that. Wow. Start thinking about, you know, our medicines and, and COVID and, and, you know, all the, all the rest of it. Have you gone to the Lord about COVID yet? Have you gone to the Lord about that, that thing that, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe if you've sprained a hand or sprained a finger, maybe it's just an annoying thing. That was King Asa, he had this annoying infection. It didn't kill him, slowed him down a little bit. It was just annoying. That's not enough to go to God for. And God was offended. He went to doctors instead of me. He went to that other country instead of me. So Jehoshaphat grew up watching this. And he's changing it up. He's not, he's got three armies coming at him. And he doesn't go and let's find other countries to try to boost up our army. No. He inquires, he starves his army and inquires of the Lord. <laughs> let's keep on going. Verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courthouse and said, because he had rebuilt, he'd rebuilt the temple. And he says, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God of heaven? who is in heaven you rule over the kingdoms of the nations power and might are in your hand and no one can, can withstand you our God did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham your friend they've lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name saying if calamity comes upon us whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and we'll cry out to you in our distress, and you'll hear us and save us. Check this out. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. So he's going through all the things that God has done. He's even kind of hinting as to how his dad responded, because he's talking about the temple. He goes, we built this temple so that when something happens, such as another country coming at us, we will stand in this temple and inquire of you and ask you to rescue us. Because he watched his dad do the, do the opposite. He emptied the temple and went, went for the human resources. No, he goes, no, God, this is a new kingdom. This is a, a, a new era in the dynasty. My dad did it one way, but I'm doing it the way that, we're, that you want us to do it. So here we are. Are you not in heaven? Are you not the one who, who rescued us and, and gave us this land that we're in, the promised land? But I got three armies coming at me. That's a fair prayer, by the way. That's a fair prayer to God. Hey, God, I remember when you did this for me, and you did that for me, and you did this for me. But What's going on? What's going on now? Thank you that you came through all those times. But what's going on now? You, you, need, you, need to, you need to do it again. Thank you very much. But you need to do it again. <laughs> I know that you can do all these things. You've done them before. But I got three armies coming at me. What... What do you do when it doesn't look like God is intervening? What do you do if it looks like he's late? What do you do if, if it looks like he's just not paying attention to you? What do you do? Here's what you do. You do what you 
do what Jehoshaphat did. Verse 12. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. Ever since my dad and I talked on the phone, that's the line that has just echoed in my, in my spirit, in my brain. I don't know what to do. But my eyes are on you. That's what you do. He's, you, you, you make him bigger than your problem. I don't know what to do. But my eyes are on you. And if you don't do something, I'm sunk. I don't know what to do. That's what you do when it looks like God is not moving. Because ultimately, God doesn't want to win wars for you. God doesn't want to provide for you. God doesn't want to make you feel better. God wants you to fix your eyes on Him. And everything else is a bonus. So He's going to use all those other things that you need Him for. And He'll pause. He'll pause. Until you get to the point where your human resources are done. And you say, God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Verse 13. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. And pause there. Jehoshaphat watched his dad mess up. The generations are watching. The generations are watching. Even, even our little friend back there, he's watching. He's watching to see. He may not even know that he's watching, but he's observing. How, 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 will, we, how will we deal with this? How will we deal with that? He's watching mom. How will, how will she deal with this? How will she deal with that? And Jehoshaphat purposely calls all the men of Judah with their wives and children the little ones, and they stood before the Lord. They stood before the Lord. Jehoshaphat gathered everybody. I'm not just going to call on the Lord. We're going to get everybody together. And that's something my parents did for me. They would call us all together and say, we're going to pray about this. And it wasn't always something that my 12-year-old brain wanted to do. But they taught me. generations are watching. Let's keep reading. Then the Spirit, this is verse 14. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Metaniah. I'm destroying his name, but that's fine. A Levite and descendant of Asaph, and he stood in the assembly. Now God's going to speak through this prophet. And he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah, Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. And I believe that this is a word from the Lord to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Do not be afraid of this vast army. Because the battle is not yours. It's God's. But, but God's got a job for you to do. Tomorrow, march down against them. Wait, huh? Imagine that. Doesn't that sound counterproductive? The battle's not mine, it's yours. But go down and march against them. Oh my goodness. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz. And isn't that interesting that God knows right where your enemy is? And you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. Jer you will not have to fight this battle. Hear it. You will not have to fight this battle. But you got a job to do. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance of the Lord will give you Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. 
Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Okay, Lord, that's easy for you to say. Did you hear me when I said three armies? That was the beginning of my prayer. I got three armies coming at me, and you're saying the battle's not mine, but it's yours, but you want me to go out and face it. And I'm not supposed to be scared or discouraged. You know what that's called? Faith. Faith. Faith isn't when the answer comes and you go, thank God. Oh, my faith is strengthened. Faith is right now when you got the armies coming at you. Faith is right now when you sit here and you refuse to be scared and you refuse to be discouraged. That's faith. He doesn't want you to walk by the answers. He wants you to walk before the answers. That's faith. Wow. The battle's not yours, it's mine, says the Lord. And by the way, the title of my message is, that's not what it looks like. Everything that you've preached so far, Chris, that's not what it looks like. And Jehoshaphat's saying, I know you did it before, and I know you're saying that the battle's not mine, it's yours, but that's not what it looks like. God specializes when that's not what it looks like. Because that's when faith kicks in, and you refuse to be discouraged, and you refuse to be down. And then you do something else. Watch this. Second Corinthians, uh, their Chronicles. Let's go to the 18th verse. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. This is before, the armies are still coming at them. Okay? They begin to worship and thank God for the answer. Then some Levites, which were the priests, from the Kohathites and Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. And though you're going through what you're going through, you came here this morning and you praised God. And that's what you're supposed to do. You're already on the right track. And after, sorry, early in the morning, verse 20, Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, in other words, what he has said, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Stop there. The art, the, I, haven't, I haven't read that they, they stopped the fast, by the way. I don't know if they were able to eat yet. It seems to all have happened within about a 24 hour period because those armies are coming at them, right? So this didn't happen over days or weeks. So he declared a fast, he starved everybody, and then he says to the singers, hey, I want you to go ahead of the swords. For, for years and years and years, I, I've loved this story for decades. I always thought that that was God's challenge for him. I want you to sing, send the singers out in front of the rest. But we just read here, whose idea was it? It was Jehoshaphat's. And the people, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. And Jehoshaphat sent them to the head of the army. Is God challenging you to do something to step out in faith that just looks ridiculous? That everybody's going to go, what in the world are you doing? That is so anti Winning the battle. And only, only you, you can know this. And only I can know what God has in my journey. May the Holy Spirit reveal it to you. If there is a challenge, 
but, but Jehoshaphat, those armies are still coming at them. But he's doing what the Lord said, I won't be discouraged and I won't be afraid. And so he went next level, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to send my singers out in front of the army. Wow. <laughs> I believe Jesus helped my unbelief. <laughs> Verse 22, we're almost there. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord, okay, here he comes, set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering them, the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked towards the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. Imagine the singers, and they're, 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 oh, by the way, did you see what they were singing? They weren't singing about the army. They weren't singing about what God needed to do. They were just lifting up that it gives thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. You love us, so you'll never forsake us. And we just want to thank you for it. And we in particular, whether we live or die, whether we live or die, I think they probably had that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego type, type spirit in this. Because they had the tangible, the three armies coming at them. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they would refuse to worship the king, to bow down and worship the king. And, and they risked death. And their answer to the king was, when he challenged them and said, you're going to die. They said, "What? Well, God can rescue us, but even if he doesn't, I will not bow down and I will not worship you. I will worship God. And so I think they had that moment where they wanted these three armies, whether we live or die, you're going to hear us praise God, even if you even if you draw the sword on me and kill me. You're going to hear me praise Him. Give thanks to the Lord. And those armies, imagine as they're singing, and they have to go over the, the pass of this, right? Over the, the path. And so as they're going up, they haven't seen the armies yet. Imagine, have you ever heard armies clash? Well, not in real life, but I've seen them. I've seen them so many times in the movies. And so imagine the commotion and the clanging and the screams and the slaughter that, that the singers are listening to as they get closer to the crest of that hill. Three armies were completely destroyed. Okay, completely destroyed. I'm just picturing the last two guys looking at each other going, are we going to do this? <laughs> And they both just spear each other at the same time. That's the end. It says not one was left. They got over and always saw the singers as they're still singing. They're still singing. And I wonder if their voice was louder before or after they saw the dead bodies. My prayer is that my voice will be louder before. Because I don't want to walk being someone who praises God in the good times. But the one who lifts up his voice to God when all hell is breaking loose. And then let's skip down a little bit. Verse, verse 20. Yeah, sorry. I, I just want to revisit something. I'm just looking at my notes. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord sent ambushes. He said, the battle's not yours, it's mine. Get out there and march against them. And Jehoshaphat said, we're going to march against them. And we're going to worship and praise because that will counteract the fear and discouragement 
that, that we're going to naturally be feeling. You know, what do you need to do? Well, it's, it's praise. It's prayer and it's praise. It's prayer with thanksgiving, Philippians 4. It's praise that's going to cure your discouragement. And it's going to, going to silence that fear. It's praise. Verse 29. Skip right down. Well, I like this. The fear of God came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. Now, I can't guarantee, in fact, you signed up for a life of trial after trial after trial after trial because it's working out something deeper in you that's more worth than the things that you're trying to protect. Your faith in God is more important than any other relationship. Your faith in God is more important than any other possession. Go back to the relationship. Jesus used this, this almost cruel analogy to show you, because he, his directive was love one another. But when it came to how much we love one another compared to how much we love God, he said, unless you hate your mother, your, your brother, your, unless you hate in comparison to how much you love God, there's no other relationship that's more important. In your relationship with God, there's no other possession or position that's more important than your faith in God. Hallelujah. And when and when people know that God is with you, that changes their attitude towards you and their reaction. The fear of God came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. You know, when my home was falling apart and I was standing on the pulpit in my former church, I had many people come to me afterwards and said, if we know what's going on, because I was very open about it all. If you can preach faith and hope and worship God the way you do, meanwhile, what's going on in, in your home, And that's inspiration I know that I can go to. People are watching. Whatever is seen is temporary, but whatever is unseen is eternal. So, therefore, we do not lose hearts. That's what we started with this morning. That's what we'll end with. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly, we're wasting away. Yet inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, they're not just, I said they're not worth comparing. That's another scripture. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. They're actually the source of the eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Because whatever is seen, but whatever's unseen, like your faith in God, and that God that you have faith in is eternal.